Good morning. morning. I'm Pastor Steve Talmadge, and along with Pastor Nanette Christofferson, we welcome you to Love of Christ Lutheran Church here in Mesa. We welcome both our in-person participants and our online live stream. Just a few announcements. Midweek Lenten services continue on Wednesday nights, 6.15 in this space. We also live stream the service. We continue our theme of uh, forgiveness. Are we in the business of restoration or retribution? And uh, we have soup supper that's being provided by uh, wonderful volunteers. Uh, That happens beginning at 5.30 uh, in rooms 48 to 50 in the back there. An invitation is extended to any who are voting members of Love of Christ Lutheran Church to consider being a voting member at the upcoming Grand Canyon Synod Assembly that will be hosted here at Love of Christ June 10th and 11th. That's a Friday, Saturday. Uh, We're allocated five lay voting members, so if you have an interest in the larger church, an interest in uh, connecting with the fellow ELCA Lutherans across our synod, uh, talk to Pastor Nanette or I, and uh, and we will, uh, Nanette or me, I guess, the English English major mother is in my head, so uh, (laughs) that happens to us, doesn't it, right, you know, they keep talking even after they're gone. uh, the Burn City Quartet, sadly, will not be here tonight. Uh, we, had, we had very few tickets pre-sold, and so the decision was made to uh, cancel that. If you bought tickets, uh, talk, uh, connect with the church office, and you'll get a refund for your tickets. Our Faith in Action donation stations continue uh, for another week. Uh, next Sunday, uh, from 9 to 11, outside the COC, uh, we have a variety in the e-news of items we're collecting for various ministry partners in the Mesa area, Southeast Valley. Uh, today, uh, the, this week's emphasis has been on hygiene kits, uh, soap, uh, shaving cream, uh, uh, deodorant, that kind of stuff. Uh, but you can bring any of the stuff in the list in the e-news at any time, and we'll make sure it gets to our partners. Uh, today, we have another faith talk in our worship. Uh, one of our uh, uh, seasonal friends Uh, uh, Gordon Graham is offering a a little witness of how God surprisingly speaks to us even when we uh, think that God maybe has the wrong person. Um, And uh, as believers in Christ, all of us have God stories. We believe in a living God that's breathing and working and moving in our midst right now. So if you have a story that you'd like to share or need a little encouragement, uh, we're happy to, 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 to take that story and share it as a way to encourage all of us as we live out our faith in this day and age. So thank you to Gordon and all previous folks who've shared a faith talk. Let's now quiet our minds. We are here to worship God. We are here to give ourselves in worship to God. So let's focus our attention on the presence of God in our midst. We gather together in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a call and ordained minister of the Church of Jesus Christ, I therefore declare to each of you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our opening songs are provided by our bell choir, Resounding Jubilation, and Great is Thy Faithfulness. Thank you. 
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. God of compassion, you welcome the wayward and you embrace us all with your mercy. By our baptism, clothe us with garments of your grace and feed us at the table of your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our worship continues with our readings from God's Word. Good morning, this fourth Sunday of Lent. Our first reading comes from Joshua 9. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt. And so that place is called Gilgal to this day. While the Israelites were camped at Gilgal, they kept the Passover in the evening on the 14th day of the month in the plains of Jericho. On the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on that day. They ate the produce of the land. And the Israelites no longer had manna. They ate the crops of the land of Cana that year. Our second reading comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, from Paul. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view. We know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us this ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting the trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the people of God. Please rise for the gospel. Our gospel reading today comes from Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, and 11 to 32. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. 
A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe and the best one and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, Your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a slave for you and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattest calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Good morning. A while ago, I had a friend share with me one of her favorite games to play when she was little. And in this game, it was a game that she played with her grandmother and her mother. And it was called Lost and Found. And so they would tell her to go get lost, to go hide, and then they would look for her. And when they found her, they would offer her a big hug and say, we're so glad we found you. We love you. She remembers playing that game over and over and over again. Well, we all know what it's like to be lost and found, and we don't have to be a child to figure that out. For many times, we can find ourselves physically lost. Physically lost in a parking lot, physically lost on a hike, physically lost trying to get to someone's house. And the interesting thing about being lost is we don't know we're lost until we realize we're lost. And then when we realize we're lost, the panic sets in. How many of you have praised God for Google Maps or Apple Map? (laughs) But we also know that we don't have to be physically lost to be lost either. We can be emotionally and spiritually lost. We can lose ourselves. We can forget who we are or whose we are. Thinking that it will be very difficult to return back to our normal self. We also know what it's like to be found, the joy when we are found, the joy and the fulfillment, the contentness that comes with being found or knowing you are found or living in a time of being found. But if we think about our lives, 
Truth be told, our lives are an ebb and flow of being lost and being found. In fact, this ebb and flow of lost and found, we can find within our day almost every single day. In our reading today, we hear of two ta- Uh, We hear of one parable, but there's two parables in Luke chapter 15 that are missing. And when you hear Luke chapter 15, oftentimes you know right away that this is the chapter of lost and found. For there's two other parables before this one. And in the parables before this one, one of them is about a parable about a shepherd who has lost one of his sheep. And he goes out to find it. And when he finds it, all the other shepherds rejoice with him that he has found this animal. We might know this feeling of if our dog is lost, right? We tell our neighbors we're looking for this dog. Maybe the neighbors start too. And when the dog is found, we all rejoice. We're so glad at having recovered this animal. The other parable is one of a widow who has a coin that she can't find, a silver coin. And so she's searching through her house, through her floor that's nothing but dirt, hoping to find this coin. And when she finds it, the neighbors, everyone rejoices with her. But as we look to the ending of this parable that we just heard, I don't see everyone rejoicing at this lost son, a human being who was thought to be dead and is now found. Why? Why aren't all willing to enter and cross the threshold into the party? Would you please pray with me? Good and gracious God, as we get ready to enter into your word this day, guide us through this parable of old, and yet this parable that we all tend to know so well. Bring us fresh ears to hear of your scandalous love, your extraordinary grace, and your forgiveness that keeps coming at us and coming at us and coming at us. Father, Spirit, Jesus, may you enter into the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts, and may it be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Pastor Steve and I are the lucky ones when it comes to our preschool, for we're the ones that get to teach a Bible lesson to the preschoolers. And as we teach these lessons, we come across the parables. And I teach the parables through a method called godly play. And in godly play, when I bring out a gold box, the children know that a parable is inside. And we talk about a gold box, and the color is gold because gold is very valuable. And I tell the children that what's inside this box, some would argue and say that the story inside here is more valuable than gold. And this box comes in a present. It looks like a present. And as we open this present, it is a gift. It is a gift that we keep returning to time and time again, the gift of a parable. As we look to this gift that we're offered today, might we hear and see new things that we haven't before. In 1986, Henry Nouwen, a famous theologian from uh, Holland and also a writer, went to St. Petersburg, Russia, And while he was there, he went to the Hermitage. And at the Hermitage, he saw the painting by Rembrandt called The Prodigal Son. And it happened to be near a window, a natural uh, window that allowed natural light in. And he stood there mesmerized for hours. Because as the light changed, so too did the painting. He could see another angle, another side to this prodigal son, another possibility as to what Rembrandt was trying to portray through this painting. As we get ready to enter into our gospel reading, I'd like us to remember a couple of things. I'd like us to remember what prodigal means. Prodigal means extravagant, extravagant wastefulness, extravagant wastefulness. 
Oftentimes, there's people who have thought that this parable should be called the parable of the two sons or the parable of the one lost son and the one found son. And some even would say that it should be called the prodigal God. Some of you may have read this book called The Prodigal God, written by Timothy Keller. And in this book, he tells us that Jesus is trying to redefine sin for us through this parable of the prodigal son. He also explains that there are two ways that we often seek happiness. And Jesus is pointing out to us these two ways that we go about searching for happiness. And one of the ways that we go about searching for happiness, we find in the elder brother. The elder brother represents the Pharisees, the ones who know that the Israel people, the Jewish people are chosen by God. And that the way to keep God pleased or really the way to uphold God and keep a community together is through the law. And that this law is about moral conformity and about community being bound together by this law. And individualism really takes a second place. If we look to the younger brother, he's more about self-discovery. Now, in the ancient world, this was really a rare thing for a brother to do. One, to be given his inheritance ahead of time, and two, then to go off and spend it. But in our world today, we often see ourselves all about this individualism, this self-discovery. And if we think about it, if we think about, on one hand, moral conformity, and we think, on the other hand, self-discovery, again, rarely does one person live their life just this way in self-discovery, and rarely does one person just live their life in moral conformity. Usually, we live our lives with a up and down of both. We have both in our lives. We kind of live in a both and. But there's lots of examples that we have in our world today of people who kind of live on one side or the other side. And one of those examples comes through a book that was written several uh, hundred years ago. And maybe some of you have seen the musical Les Miserables. And in that musical, we have the character Jean Valjean. And Jean Valjean has been in prison. He was put there five years for stealing a loaf of bread, but then added extra time because he tried to run. He's finally let out of prison and is given a pink slip. But he also has a parole officer named Javert. And as Jean Valjean goes off into the world trying to find a job and get a fresh start, he can't find one because this pink slip keeps preventing him from getting it. Or if he gets a job, he only receives half pay. Well, one night he finds himself knocking at a door and it happens to be a bishop. And the bishop offers him and extends grace by giving him a meal and a place to sleep. And in the middle of the night, Jean Valjean steals the bishop's silver candlesticks and runs. But he's caught by the police. And of course, the parole officer, Javert, is there. And they go to, uh, the, back to the bishop's house because Jean Valjean told the priest, or actually told the, <laughs> told the police, that the bishop had given him these candlesticks. So when they approach the bishop, the police say to the bishop, he says that you gave him these candlesticks. And the bishop goes, yes, that is true. I gave those to him. The police leave and the bishop looks at Jean Valjean and says, you have a chance. You have a chance to start a new life. I am giving you these candlesticks. Go and begin it. But Javert, who is about the law and about life in the law, keeps going after Jean Valjean because Javert really doesn't believe in second chances. And he knows that Jean Valjean will mess up again somehow, some way. As we look at these two different characters, we can also look at the extremes that we see, like I said earlier in our lives, these two paradigms. But like I said before, rarely do we find ourselves one or the other. Most of the time, we are an ebb and flow of these two paradigms. Jesus, though, is pointing out today something to us about these paradigms. He's pointing out to us that neither son has it right. The elder son doesn't really seek a relationship with his father, 
nor does the younger son. Both sons tend to want to use the father for whatever they can. But neither one is seeking a relationship with the father. The elder son is willing to conform and do whatever it takes to be able to get the inheritance that he deserves. The younger son took the inheritance and squandered it away, not wanting a relationship with the father. The younger son realizes he's lost. Remember how I said we don't always know how lost we are until we realize we're lost? And he seeks repentance. And he goes back to his father. And his father is so happy to see him that he throws him this amazing party. I believe Jesus is also showing us a couple of things about this paradigm. Neither brother had it right. They didn't want a relationship with the father. But Jesus is also showing us how lost we can become in these two ways of living. That these two ways of living can lead to spiritual dead ends. And so as the father rejoices that his son has come home, the other one, the elder brother, is not happy about this. He's upset. He's still not seeking a relationship with the father. He's so angry, so angry at his father's outrageous love, so angry at his father's scandalous way of just giving his brother a fatted calf, so angry that he can't even think about forgiving his brother. And yet the father will keep coming, will keep coming and intersecting and coming after and offering an invitation to the son to come into the party. Because this father is gracious. This father has an abundance of grace, unconditional grace, always inviting us, always inviting us into the party, always inviting us to cross over this threshold of forgiveness, this threshold of grace, this threshold of scandalous love. God is inviting us to this party of grace. Are we ready to cross over? Amen. Good morning. My name is Gordon Graham, and we winter, we are winter members of this church. Today I have a testimonial of faith, peace, reconciliation, and happiness. Does the Spirit speak to you? Both my wife and I received in our lifetime many blessings and opportunities to praise the Lord and give thanks. Joyce and I have both recovered from serious cancers. Plenty of time and reason for reflection and prayers. Thanks to the Lord for the many gifts of hospitals, learning of skills, compassionate and talented nurses, surgeons and doctors. In 2018, while Joyce was post-surgery and still very weak, Bishop Magabo of Rwanda and his children sat behind us at a church, and we knew of their nation and mission needs in Rwanda since the genocide of April 1996. At this time, Bishop Magabu asked Joyce to come to Rwanda in peace. At some time much later, I asked Joyce what she would like to do as a celebration of a full recovery. Go to Rwanda. We began to raise money for the mission, assistance for the completion of Peace International High School in Rwanda. In 2019, we went with seven others from our church to the school in Rwanda for three weeks to help at the elementary school, teach with children, and provide some small development at the high school. That seemed to be the end of our involvement. At a service later with a message of service, 
I heard myself say to Bishop Dennis Magabu that I would be of service to him. Then I said to myself, did I really say that? What do I know about service and what could I offer? A voice continued to say to me, you need to raise the money to complete the high school. My prayers would answer, I am the wrong person. I have no experience in raising money and there are so many others with drive and experience, not even a lemonade stand. I do have an entire career experience of spending project money on very large, mostly international projects. This calling went on many times over many months. All the blessings that the God provided over our life and I was saying no to the message from the Spirit. I eventually discussed this opportunity with Joyce, asking if she would be agreeable to us undertaking this challenge, to which she agreed. We had no idea of how to raise money. Eighteen months had passed following our visit, and no new money or support was coming to the high school and the opportunity for a financially deprived child's education past the sixth grade was not happening. The building was at a standstill. I made a project budget to complete the high school, including all the work and all the materials. Then we let a few people know of our goal and mission, and the doors began to open by themselves. We had provided the road, the path, to donations, and each month the Spirit found the people, encouraged and invited them to find the spiritual trail we set in place to help this cause. Sure, we made a few presentations of what is happening during the high school building completion. Still today, we do not know how to raise funds. What was needed was a path and us as contact persons, an ear to listen to. The Lord and the Spirit in Jesus have done all the rest. Our thanks and praise and our prayers. The finishing of the high school in Rwanda is now over 60% complete. Our experience when the Lord speaks to you and the many ways in your life that you can help or offer comfort and we know he must speak to you as he does to us. Please don't be afraid to say yes. Thanks for all the wonderful things the Lord does and many evils that test his might. We also thank Pastor Steve and especially Pastor Nanette for making this opportunity for all to share how we each month and many times a day are touched by the Lord in many ways. Thank you for this opportunity.
invite the congregation to stand as we join together in making confession of our faith as it's recorded in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he'll come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the life everlasting. Life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. Merciful God, we pray for the whole world. We pray that the whole world might know that you are a God who's in the business of finding the lost. That you are a God who awaits any with wide arms extended to welcome them home. Lord, you know the struggle that we feel when your grace is extravagant, when your love is unconditional, when your forgiveness is endless. Though we cherish it and want it for ourselves, it is difficult when we feel others aren't worthy of it. Change our hearts to be like yours. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the church universal. We pray for brothers and sisters in Christ around the globe. We pray for all who are part of the body of Christ, that you give them the spirit to live out your mission and ministry of compassion of care, of inclusion, of welcome. Lord, in your mercy, we pray, O Lord, particularly for our sisters and brothers who are a part of the Lutheran World Federation, and particularly our brothers and sisters who are engaged in the middle of conflict, seeking to minister in the face of their own anxiety and worry. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the well-being of creation, and as dwellers in the desert, we are mindful that a hundred-year compact with use of the Colorado River has come to an end, and decisions need to be made by the states and the nation of Mexico and the tribes within those states as they seek to steward this limited resource. Gracious God, you know the power of drought, You know the need for collaboration and cooperation as Lake Mead and Lake Powell get lower and lower and the flow of the river gets less. We need fresh water to live. We need fresh water for the farms that grow our food. So give us the wisdom and provide us what is needed so that we can continue to dwell in this world. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for peace and justice in the world. Our hearts continue to break. Our hearts are heavy for the Ukraine. We pray for families that are separated. We pray for elderly who are stuck. We pray for children who just don't understand what's going on. We pray for the soldiers that are taking risks. And we pray for the leaders that are working to find a path to end this conflict. And we know, Lord, as we listen, that there's really one person who really has the power to stop the violence. So we pray specifically for Vladimir Putin, that he'll bring this war to an end. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who are hungry and those who are unhoused. Particularly, as we know, that one in five children have food insecurity and hundreds of thousands of 
of, of houses, affordable houses, are needed for those who are struggling to put a roof over their head. Give us the wisdom and how we can use the abundance that you provide so that nobody goes hungry and everyone has shelter. Lord, in your mercy. We each carry around with us a list of loved ones that are so important to us who are struggling in body, mind, and spirit. We name them before you. From this community, we lift up those who are going through treatment and tests. Barb, John, Dan, Elizabeth, Rhonda. We pray for Connie, Ken, Rod, Bill, and Mary. We pray for those awaiting surgery, for Jack, Nancy, Karen. We pray for all who are grieving, particularly the family and friends of Doug Rhodes, who died on Friday, the family and friends of Hunter Measley, whose mom died on Friday. Bring comfort and courage to those through the promise of resurrection given to us through Jesus' victory over the grave. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, commending and trusting in your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our sending him softly and tenderly. Holy.
what weight or words could be held within my offering. When he alone is worthy, a glory song is inscribed upon my heart. This treasure held in an alabaster jar. To bring him all the glory Praise God from whom all blessings flow Praise Him all creatures here below What sacrifice could be 